And one more. Okay, so everybody thinking what the meaning is of this, we're going to um, sing that little prayer. Last will lead us in the little prayer. And basically it's um, the mandala is referring to our environment, really everything in the environment. You know, if you look at those round pictures, they're really just architectural drawings of the environment of Buddhas. We usually refer to those as a mandala. I don't know what the origin of the word is, but in, the mandala is where you live. So basically with <clears throat> this here, and we're, we're talking here, the environment that we live in. So as it says in English, this ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, making it very beautiful. So of course, this is Buddhist cosmological view of the universe, not ours. Adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. And we think, I imagine this is a Buddha field and I offer it. And we're offering it to the Buddha as a request for the teachings. That's the meaning. So if you know the Buddhist cosmological view of the universe, you imagine all those things. If not, you just think of all the marvelous things of this universe that we know about, that we that make people happy, all the objects of the senses. You pile them all up and offer as a request for the teachings. That's the plan. He will be ready in a second. Go last. Yes. Zashi Perky Ju Jing Meto Trahamri Radlinji Nihidek Yan Padi Sange Jing Du Mek Te Uwai Ju Kunam Dashing La Jerpacho Jetson Lama Dam Takenam Ketcher Kikala Ken Setcher Tinti Jita Saham Begil Echimala Sabgetcher Kichapa Lap to so Edam Guratnam and Dalakami at Sayami. Reminding ourselves of our reliance on the Buddha and the, the Dharma. And the second two lines are expressing our motivation, our reason, our purpose for being together, listening to these teachings, thinking that, um, so I'll say it first in English, a little bit more words, and then we'll do two times in Tibetan. So it's saying, we're saying, until we're enlightened, we are going to rely upon the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. First point, second point. And then by the virtuous karmic seeds we plant in our mind, by listening to these teachings, you know, may these seeds ripen in the future, no matter how long it takes as our Buddhahood, so that then we can be of effortless benefit to suffering sentient beings. That's the idea. Sangye chodang soke chog nam la jan chul badu dagni kyab su chi dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki dro la penche sangye drupa shog Sangye chadang soke chog nam la jan chul badu dagi kyab su chi dagi chon yen gi pe sonam ki dro la penche sangye drupa shog. Okay, samsara nirvana. So as always, you know, these, these course notes here, these, this teaching was given by um, a German monk, Venerable Fedor. And when he gave these teachings, it said, he says in there, he's, you know, he's been studying at Sarah J Monastery in Southeast India for 10 years. I think this is like, this, this, these teachings were given like 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I think. So he's now based in Germany for many years. He's virtually done all the, the, the study in Tibetan with the monks at Sarah, which is Lama Zoba Lama Yeshi's monastery. I think they virtually qualify him to be a Geshe. I don't know if he's done his Geshe degree, but he's done all that study. So he's well educated. And his teachings are very extensive and very, very, very helpful. He, as always, will be giving far more details than me. So please, I encourage you, encourage you to study the course notes well. He's really excellent, giving great detail, you know. So, okay, what's the, let's get the overview. Where are we at here? If we take this packaging of the lamb rim, as we know so well from hearing, this graded path, this course that, you know, you study grade one, grade two, grade three, and then graduate eventually as a Buddha from having studied it. 
you know, it, with the first section of the teachings, as Lamazova would politely say, which is what we've studied until now, is, um, you know, the teachings and practices suitable to the disciple of the least capability. Sometimes this first lot of teachings are referred to as the teachings of the lowest scope referring to the scope of the practitioner's mind. I mean, that's, you know, that's why I use colloquially use the term junior school. And so basically studying what we've done so far really is um, the teachings about karma, the teachings about how the, um, these are really, the teachings about karma anyway, and refuge and karma and death and impermanence. These are from the first scope. Technically the teachings about the mind, which is the very first module we study, that really you don't study until you get to the second one. This is the middle scope or the teachings and practices suitable to the disciple of the middle capability, which is the topic now of this, this module. But we, because in, the, in our modern world, we've got such a radically different view of the mind and what it is, it's important to start with getting an idea of the Buddhist view of the mind because it's the mind that gets enlightened. So it's necessary for us to start with that as we've done. So basically the, very, the, the teachings, the essence of the first, the essence of the teachings in the first scope, the essence of the teachings in the first scope of practice, or I like to call junior school, the essence of it is to a, the, the actual practice is to abide by the laws of karma, to practice the ethics of not harming. So what's the point of that? How does that, where, what's, the, what's, what's the point of that? in this leading of us to Buddhahood. Well, it's the very, it's, it's learning, it's getting, it's stopping the core, the causes of the first kind of suffering. So the Four Noble Truths is presented in this module. We're gonna look at the Four Noble Truths, the teaching, the first teaching that Buddha gave. So he, he presents three levels of suffering. The very first noble truth, first truth for the noble ones is that there is, suffering and he presents three levels so the first level of suffering is when it's called the suffering of suffering and basically it's when the bad things happen so there's two ways of describing that which we'll go into here one way is in terms of buddha's view of the entirety of samsara as this is the part of this is this um, module the, the entirety of samsara for the buddha samsara is a word you're in samsara if basically you're caught up in in all these delusions and all this nonsense and negative karma another way of referring to samsara is is this different realms of existence that we go from one to the other from you know go go here and there, up and down. So the realms of samsara for the buddha are, are defined by their being they're defined by suffering. And once you're out of samsara, you're in nirvana. So nirvana is, is not like an alternative place to the realms of existence. It's not as if you, that's heaven and samsara is like, you know, miserable. It's not like that. Nirvana, being in nirvana is not a place. It's a state. It's accomplished when you've quit samsara, when you've cut the causes of samsara, when you've cut negative karma and you've cut the causes of samsara, which is the delusions. And when you've eventually realized emptiness, that's when you're then have achieved your nirvana, your cessation of suffering, your liberation from suffering. So the first kind of suffering is called the suffering of suffering. So in terms of the realms of existence, that's, you know, referring within this, um, this is referring to the worst, the most suffering realms of existence, you know, and we're going to go into this, we're going to go into more detail. Then, this, then the next, so the, uh, by abiding by the first level of practice, the first scope of the Lam Rim, essentially abiding by the laws of karma, that's the method to stop the future suffering of suffering. It's guaranteed if you abide by the laws of karma and don't kill and don't lie and don't steal. And as we've discussed, live in vows of these good ethics. It's guaranteed you will never be reborn in suffering rebirths because you, you're creating the causes for um, stopping the suffering of suffering, stopping the worst kind of suffering. Because the causes of the worst kind of suffering, the born in the lower realms, which we're going to talk about, is harming sentient beings, killing, 
stealing, lying, etc., etc., etc. But the, the suffering of suffering also refers to the experiences of bad things happening, even within a human body, because a human body is 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 not the result of is not called the suffering of suffering. A human body is actually referring to the second kind of suffering, which is called the suffering of change, which is a subtler level of suffering. So the first, by abiding by the laws of karma, you, you ensure that you don't have the suffering of the lower realms. But it also ensures, as we've discussed when we looked at refuge and the lay vows and living in vows, it ensures you won't have suffering you won't have negative tendencies you'll get born as a nice human you'll also get born with no tendency to kill steal or lie you'll have no you won't have any experiences of suffering at the hands of others and you won't have suffering environments all these four ways that karma ripens so by abiding by the laws of good ethics not harming which is the first scope abiding by the laws of karma that's the method to stop the suffering of suffering. So now the method to stop the suffering of change, which is a subtler level of suffering, which we're only going to discuss, is to the causes of that is attachment and the other and attachment and the other delusions. So we need to understand the subtler levels of suffering, which are the delusions and the subtle level of suffering, the suffering of change, which is what actually we call happiness. So, you know, as far as we're concerned, in, in our daily life, when a bad thing happens, we call it suffering. And when a good thing happens, we call it happiness. Well, for the Buddha, when the good thing happens, because it's driven by attachment, it's actually a subtle level of suffering. And to understand this is crucial in order to understand Buddha's teachings properly. You know? So in general, again, using these two, this nice analogy, two wings of the bird, the first wing is the wisdom wing, and that's that's the that's the achievement at this or at this level here of giving up the sufferings of suffering and giving up the suffering of change, and that's referred to as renunciation. So the essence of the main realization that we want to accomplish from practicing the first and second scopes, practicing junior school and high school, practicing the wisdom wing, is renunciation, which is meaning we want to give up suffering and its causes. You've finally given up suffering and its causes when you've actually realized emptiness. That's the final method. But in the Lam Rim, that, um, the realization of emptiness doesn't come until the Bodhisattva path. So renunciation here is referring to a very fierce, deep comprehension of these subtler level of suffering, being revolted by it and wanting to give it up and also understanding its causes. So as Lama Zerbarujay says, we have achieved renunciation when, when just the thought of another moment of attachment is so repulsive, so disgusting, it's like being in a septic tank. Now that's like laughable for us because we live in attachment. We swim in attachment. We adore attachment. In fact, we don't even understand attachment. So it's a much subtler level of suffering, a much subtler level of suffering, but it's not the subtlest. The subtlest level of suffering is actually called all pervasive suffering or conditioned suffering. And that is realized that's accomplished when we realize emptiness. So we accomplish the cessation of the first kind of suffering, the suffering of suffering, when the bad things happen, when we've given up harming others, which is the first scope. We accomplish this, the, we cease the suffering of change, getting renunciation by understanding attachment and giving up attachment. And that's in the second scope of practice when we've given up the suffering of change when we finally realize emptiness and accomplish that we've given up the suffering all pervasive suffering so it's each stage of the practices is can is giving up ever subtler levels of suffering 
So, of course, talking about suffering is not comfortable for us. We sort of feel like it's very depressing. Buddhism is so depressing. Talks about suffering all the time. You know, but I mean, it's sort of, it's kind of, it's, it's common sense. If you've got cancer, you, it, you know, the doctor, the oncologist you're going to go to, you want them to have the most detailed analysis and understanding of this disgusting disease. You, you know, they don't want to say, oh, I don't want to look at cancer. That's too ugly. They have to delve deep into cancer. They have to see it under a microscope. They've not got to know exactly what it is. They've got to swim in the suffering of cancer in order to understand it, in order to find the solution to it. It's really obvious, you know, but it doesn't make us comfortable. So the Four Noble Truths, the Four Truths for the Noble Ones, Lord Buddha's first teaching. The first one is he states there is suffering. And he goes into these three levels of it. And then he tells us the causes of it. And this really makes sense because if you say you, you have a problem, You've got to state what the problem is and you've got to know it really intimately. You've got to know the details of the problem. You've got to identify the problem precisely. Then you've got to know what caused it. That tells you the solution. If you don't know the cause, you, you can detail cancer to the subtlest degree, but if you don't know the causes of it, and this is the problem in the West, in our medical systems, we, you know, we, we seem to understand some, but we also see, no matter how much we understand the causes, some people don't, don't, don't get cured from it. It's one of those diseases we say is not guaranteed to be cured from, you know? So of course the Buddhist perspective is because we don't understand karma. And that's, and that's and literally because suffering, so cancer is an example of the suffering of suffering. Sickness is an example of the suffering of suffering. Bad things happening, being stolen from, being sick, being punched in the nose, being poor, they are the suffering of suffering. And Buddha's analysis of them, you know, it's not enough just to look at the present life. That's the, the radical difference with Buddha. So we have to understand the name of the suffering, its characteristics, and then we have to look at the causes. And once you know the causes, then the solution is really simple. It's clear. I mean, this is the whole point. But we sort of don't hear it so simply because we're so overwhelmed by it seems like I must have been a bad person in the past. We don't want to think about it. So, you know, for example, Buddha would tell us that um, being, you know, dying young, being sick, no, being sick, no, being sick, yeah, that's an environmental result, the type of karma called environmental karma, and it's the result of past killing. So you, you see what the, the name of the problem is. It's called dying. It's called getting sick. So, of course, you can look at the different kinds of sicknesses. There's no problem with that because there are always two causes. There are the temporary conditions right now, but then there are the initial causes, the main causes, you know. And the main causes for Buddha, the main causes for Buddha, the main causes for Buddha, It's Rabina here. It's Rabina here, and I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of a teaching, honey. So I'll talk to you later. Um, excuse me, some a prisoner friend. Okay. So if the problem is, we're using Buddha's analysis here. If the problem is getting, is the problem is say um, getting sick, then that is one of the karmic results for the Buddha. The cause of it is past killing. Now, you could, it could be cancer or it could be, um, you know, a cold. They're both sicknesses. And indeed, you know, you go to your doctor and you get the temporary solution to the cold and the temporary solution to the cancer. But the main solution, maybe, maybe it's too late to solve this one. Maybe the karma is so strong, you can't stop it, but, you, but sometimes you can. So then if you understand the main cause of it, which is past killing, and then you, and you stop killing, you live in vows of not killing, and you purify killing, don't be surprised, you might even be able to create, uh, purify the cancer now. But the guaranteed point is, you will never get cancer again. You will never get sick again. This is the logic of Buddhist teachings, you know. 
So in every case, every millisecond of happiness and every millisecond of, 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 of suffering, as far as the Buddha's analysis is concerned, the first cause is within ourself. The first cause is karma and the second cause and the subsume, the two subsume to one, the delusion in, for, in terms of suffering, the delusion that can impel you to do the action. And in terms of happiness, it was the past karma and the virtue. So the, this, is, this is the Buddha's analysis. So understanding the causes of something tells you the solution. It's very logical, you know. So, the Four Noble Truths then. I mean, I'm gonna speak just simply, Venerable Tendor, the Fedor gives you much more detailed teachings. Of course he does, it's very interesting. So, you know, um, so the first noble truth, the first one is there are, there is suffering. And he, Buddha articulates three levels of suffering. The first one is the suffering of suffering. And that's when the bad things happen. So now there's two levels of that, as we're discussing. The bigger picture in Buddhism, Buddha asserts from his own direct experience and this is a view that was existing before he came along these indian scholars and yogis had already observed this that there are billions and trillions and trillions of sentient beings and all are living in different realms of existence different literally different capacities of mental experience all of which come along with a certain level of physicality so there's one way of dividing them is into, this is very much the Indian tradition and is posited in the Buddhist one too. There are three realms. One is called the, uh, one is called the, the formless realm. One is called the form realm and one is called the desire realm. So the form and formless realms are very much subtle states of mind for those who've achieved really high levels of single pointed concentration, samadhi, this technique these brilliant Indians invented. And as far as they're concerned in their system, when you've got to the peak of the formless realm, that for them is liberation. But that's where Buddha diverged. He, he saw that there were still delusions left. There was still the view of intrinsic existence. So he diverged in his own direction and that's where Buddha's teachings about emptiness, that's the, distinct, the distinguishing characteristic. So as far as Buddha is concerned, the formless realm is, they, you know, is like it's still within samsara and the form realm is slightly grosser. And then you've got the desire realm and then we're all in that one. So there's like, I always say, there's like six suburbs in, in the desire realm. Six levels of um, states of mind divided between, on, along the spectrum of enormous levels of joy, all the way down to the most intense levels of unbelievable suffering. So the God realms, there's a couple of God realms. They talk, they use, they use the term God realms. Um, and those states, those beings, uh, uh, the, the experiences of them are said to be incredibly blissful. Amazingly, they last a long, long, long time. It's the fruit of masses of virtue of goodness, and it lasts a long, long time. The experience is incredible joy, incredible bliss. The physical bodies are made of light. Everything is radiant and marvelous. So this, you could argue, is the equivalent of what the Muslims would call paradise and what the Christians would call heaven. So it seems to me, I always say this over the centuries, humans have observed similar things, but they've obviously come up with different uh, explanations of them all, you know? So there's beings experiencing that. That's in the desire realm. That's like the best, the best happiness you can get, the best bliss. Then you've got the human realm. Now, clearly our bodies are not made of light. That's a fact. And so, but it too is the fruit of virtue. You know, when we talked about karma, um, the, the main karma the one that they call the throwing karma or the karmic action that's a complete action is the one that the seed of which would be triggered at our past death that determines the type of rebirth we get. Rebirth as a God, rebirth as a human or whatever. So, um, though, so a virtuous karmic seed is the cause of getting a human body. 
Nat two is called is these three are known as the upper realms because they're states of of relative happiness. But in terms of Buddha's analysis of the three kinds of suffering, these are called the suffering of change, which is what we refer to as happiness. So we're going to look at that and, and argue and look at Buddha's view of why it's called suffering. Then you've got the three so-called lower realms. And these are the result of a negative throwing karma, such that at the time of the death, one of the negative seeds caused by coming from killing or harming others is triggered. And then that consciousness is thrown into, as they say, being born as an animal or a spirit or a hell being. Again, humans over the centuries have observed similarities. So these are these are levels of suffering, and they and the they and then they're also depicted as being the expressions of the three main delusions. So they would say that the animals is a is a predominance of the of the um, the, the the root delusion called ignorance. The spirit realm is a predominance of the of the delusion called attachment. And the hell realms is a predominance of a delusion called anger. So there's there. So all of these realms, the only way to get used to this is all of these realms are minds, all these billions upon billions upon billions of sentient beings, they're minds. And due to the karma that was created by each of those sentient beings, and due to the karma that's specifically triggered at the time of the past death, then that's the rebirth you get. So they're all states of mind each of which have their own level of physicality, you know? So spirits, you could argue their physical energy isn't really just made of air. The air element predominates and the state of mind is intense, unbelievably intense, intense, unbelievable, unbelievable intense suffering. In particular, the suffering of unbelievable attachment, levels of which we can't even conceptualize. You could argue the hell realms. You could argue this because the, in the Vajrayana, they talk about how all physical, all bodies are made of the four elements, you know? I mean, you could argue the hell realms, their bodies are predominantly fire. Their minds are conjoined with fire. And the, and the state of that, the le that level of suffering, that's known as the suffering of suffering. The spirits and the hell and the animals are the suffering of suffering. The humans and the gods are the suffering of change. Now, the third lot, the form and the formless, they don't have the suffering of suffering and they don't have the suffering of change. They only have this, the all pervasive suffering because they haven't realized emptiness yet. So there's levels and levels of describing like this. Now, the other way to talk about suffering, and we're going to be doing that because it's easier for our minds, we'll talk about, is within this human realm. So getting a human body is, in fact, the suffering of change. You know, it's not the most intense suffering but we can have the results within this rebirth of the suffering of suffering, the tendency to keep killing, getting killed, dying young, getting sick. They are also the suffering of suffering. So anyway, within samsara, then you've got the formless realm who only have got the all pervasive suffering and the form realm, these very subtle minds in the depths of samadhi, different levels. Then you've got the, the, the desire realm, You've got the gods, these blissful, extremely happy as a result of virtue with subtle light bodies, which last a long, long time. Then you've got the humans, which is also an upper rebirth as a result of virtue. Then you've got the lower realms, the animals, the spirits and the hells. So all beings in the universe without exception who, aren't, who haven't realized emptiness are within these realms of existence. Put it like that. This is Buddha's analysis, Buddha's observation. So the very first level of practice in the teachings and practices of the first scope, <clears throat> there they talk about how these are the teachings and practices shared by the people of this lower scope, a sentient being with the least capability. One, <clears throat> and you could, and here, you could argue that's equivalent. Well, no, that's the teachings and practice that you would do that ensure you won't get the worst kind of suffering. You won't get born in the lower realms. And if you live in vows, you can ensure that you won't have the suffering experiences either of being stolen, to, stolen from, lied to, and so on and so forth, especially if you live in vows. 
So here now, in the second scope, we're going to look at the teachings and practices that are shared by beings of the second capable, this subtle, this, this, this other level of capability. And this is the practitioners who, let's say you're in Thailand or um, Burma, you would practice what's called the Theravadan Buddhist teachings, which are these practices, the same in the first scope and the second scope. These are practices shared by those practitioners whose goal is to achieve liberation from suffering and its causes, not Buddhahood, but Nirvana, your own liberation from suffering, your own Nirvana. These are the practices shared by those beings. But given that we're in the Mahayana tradition and our broader goal is to achieve Buddhahood, then we're going to move on after this to the Mahayana component, which will come after this one, you know. There'll be practices and teachings suitable um, that are shared by beings on the great scope. So here, let's look then at how, we've done this before, but look at how what we call happiness, which is happy feelings, when happy things happen, when pleasant feelings come, which is basically when you get what attachment wants, why that for the Buddha is actually a more subtle level of suffering. So first of all, Let's again look at the Four Noble Truths. The first one, there is suffering. First one is the suffering of suffering. And the causes of, and then the second one is the suffering of change. And the third one is what? So this, then we go to the second Noble Truth. And that's where it says, he, he, he outlines the, the causes. And there are two main causes. Two main causes. And they're both inside oneself. These causes that Buddha's talking about are the main causes of suffering. And indeed, you can flip it over. They're also the main causes of happiness but they're both inside oneself. That's the part that's shocking and quite radical. Because when we think of suffering, the first that we think there's one cause and it's the boyfriend or the weather or the thing out there, you know? But for the Buddha, it's inside. It's inside, it's within us. Because if you experience this suffering, you, you know, the cause has to be within you. So there are two main causes of suffering. One is called karma and one is called delusions. One is called karma and one is called delusions. Well, actually in the first scope, we deal with karma. We deal with least stopping that cause of suffering. We stop harming others. Karma means action. So simply speaking, you know, there's, you know, let's say anybody, there's Lars and he punches me in the nose. Well, as far as Buddha's concerned, there are two main causes of suffering and they're both inside me. One is the action I did in the past, you know, 27 lives ago, two lives ago, whatever. Similar to that, to him, karma's pretty personal. And two, the second cause, which is the main one, is the delusion that impelled me to do it. And that's pretty straightforward. It's either attachment or anger, you know, don't, get, don't make it complicated. They're the two main causes of my suffering. They're, so one, that's the explanation of why I'm experiencing suffering at this moment in me. And it even explains why Lars did it. You know, in our culture, as far as we're concerned, Lars is the main cause of my suffering. He punched me in the nose. So as soon as we then get Lars and we, you know, we and we and we arrest him and we get, send him off to the psychologist and we try to analyze why we we try to analyze why did Lars do it? Because we think he is the main cause, and then we've got to look at why did Lars do it. So of course we then have to look at what happened to Lars. So we discover he got two crummy parents and they beat him up when he was a boy, and we go, ha ha! Now we know why Lars beat Rabina. Now, this is what I find very fascinating. It, it is reasonable. It's, it's some kind of re reality there that we can see that Lars hits people because he learned it from his daddy. But it doesn't answer the question, which I'm interested in. Hey, hey, excuse me. Why me? Why did he punch me? And by saying that Lars is mean and nasty because his father taught him doesn't answer why me and I find that very interesting because that's the question we ask when I'm freaking out how dare you do that to me I will say I don't deserve it why did that happen to me we ask this all the time why is this war in, in Ukraine why did that little dog get harmed why is that baby being abused 
It's not enough just to point to the external, at the Russian army, at the abuser, at the rapist. It's not enough. But the Buddha answers both. Why even this moment of suffering and why did Lars even do it to me? Because karma's personal, karma's specific, karma's precise. It's a natural law that runs the universe, you know. So the two main causes of that moment of suffering are both inside Rabina. One is the past action that Rabina did, past life, and the other one, which, and the two subsumed to this, is the delusion that impelled me to do it. So then the first scope of practice, abiding by the laws of karma, that deals with the first part. If I stop harming, I cannot possibly ever get harmed in the future. This is the logic. But now we've got to, that's, and that's the first level of practice. Now we've got to get to the root of the problem and now look at the delusion that it compelled me to harm because now we've got to look into that one and want to give up that one. But also we've got to now look at these delusions. And when, when we discuss the mind, we discussed all this, you know. When we discuss karma, we discuss all this. It's repeating all the time. So we have to understand the delusions. We have to understand the negative states of mind. We have to understand the non-virtuous states of mind because they are what compel sentient beings to harm each other. So in the again, like we were talking in the first scope, you, you control the servants of the delusions, the body and the speech. At least you stop creating future suffering of suffering by stopping harming others with your body and speech. Now we get to the root of the problem. We have to delve into the mind and get to the delusions which compel the body and speech to do that harm. So we've talked about this countless times. So this is where we have to understand the Buddhist model of the mind. And this is where, I mean, Fedor, he goes, Fedor, he's very clear. He, he uses the outline of Lama Tsongkhapa's Lam Rim as the basis of his teachings. And I'm not doing that. I'm all over the place. I'm sorry. He's giving great detail. It's so helpful to study what he's written in these course notes. They're really excellent. He goes into great detail about all of this and looks into the many different delusions and the many states of mind. And we might get into that later too. So here I'm just going to get to the essence of it, which is, of course, the essence of getting renunciation is to understand attachment. You know, this is the one, as Lama Zopa says, you've got renunciation when just the thought of another moment of attachment is so disgusting, it's like being in a septic tank. So to understand why attachment is because this is the one that is the sort, the basis of all the others. This is something we do not think like in our modern psychological interpretations, you know? So there's three poisons the Buddha talks about. The root delusion, you know, the one that is the source of all suffering in the first place, such that once you've uprooted it by realizing emptiness, you've now really, you know, achieved cessation of the three levels of suffering. That's the root. But the main voice of that one is ego grasping. It's known as attachment. And it's this, you know, its main function this is the one that drives, this is, why, this is why Buddha calls it this realm of existence of these six realms. That's why he calls it the desire realm. Desire is another word for attachment. Desire is another word for attachment. Attachment, craving, desire, they're synonymous, you know? And it's this primordial, as I, as I always talk, emotional hunger. And it drives every second of our day. Of course, we've all got, also got our virtues. They play roles in our life. And to the extent that we have any virtue at all is the extent to which attachment, you know, is slightly less. More attachment, less virtue, more insane, more outrageous, more suffering, more nightmarish. The more virtue, the less attachment, you know. Atta the virtues are our saving grace. But here, We've got to, this is in this first scope and second scope of teachings. We've got to really understand suffering and its causes. And so that means enormous detail. 
which is very shocking for us because it's so depressing initially. You know, we just want, why can't we talk about the good things we'll say, you know? Because we're trying to identify suffering and its causes. That's why. It's easy to see. So attachment is the main one, effectively. And then when it doesn't get what it wants, as we discussed, that's called anger. Now, anger is easy to see how that can be causing suffering. That's easy. It's kind of when it's expressive, when it's very volatile. And anger clearly is heavier, you know? It's more violent, isn't it? You can see it. Look at the world. Look at the world, please, people. Don't make it complicated. You know, look at the world. Anger is unbelievable, the harm it does. Unbelievable, the harm it does. It's so evident, isn't it? But it's really hard to see how attachment even, even is a problem. It's much more subtle, so much harder to see. Because it looks like it's just because it's so pervasive and it's kind of mild. And this, of course, is attachment like you're a junkie or alcohol or eating, you know, or jumping on 24 boys every day. When it's a grosser level of attachment, it's only then in our culture that we think it's a problem. This is the point, you know. In our culture, when you, you know, you want heroin or alcohol, you eat food all day and you're 400 pounds in weight or you jump on 22 girls a day or four, you know, 24 boys a day, then we say <coughs> that attachment's a problem and we call it addiction. Addiction's a great word. Buddha would say attachment is addiction. This is the main way to understand, you know? Attachment is craving, addiction, you know? It's got all the qualities of obsessive compulsive it's got the qualities of being really kind of busy 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 it's got the qualities of emotional hunger it's got the qualities of possessiveness it's got the qualities of craving it's got all of that but because most of us maybe aren't junkies aren't jumping on 24 boys a day we therefore don't think we have the problem of addiction but this is the point, the Buddha's view of it is much more subtle. It's my way of putting it, you know, it's much more subtle, much, much harder to identify. Because every millisecond of what we think and do and say, if we're an ordinary person, is literally driven by attachment. This is very depressing to hear, you know, because what, in other words, it's so normal, we just think it's, we take it for granted. It's just normal life. So we have to understand it, you know? So we start with the gross level by understanding what, it's, what it is, you know? And first of all, it's a state of mind. Secondly, it's a conceptual state of mind, which is very shocking to us. We know that makes us a big surprise to us. But when we studied the mind, remember, when we look back at the mind, we studied the mind, we looked at the mind, we looked at the mental consciousness, and the mental consciousness can only function in two ways, conceptually or a more subtle level, when you've only got single point of concentration. So effectively, we don't have that, then we live at the gross level of mental consciousness, which is conceptuality, which includes all our emotions. It includes all the delusions. It even includes all the virtues. We live at a very gross level of mental consciousness. This is pretty abstract for us because we don't have the same model of the mind in the West. You know? So attachment, the definition of it, the definition of it is it is a conceptual thought that exaggerates the deliciousness of something. That's the bare bones definition. Anger is a conceptual thought that exaggerates the ugliness of something. Pride, for example, I mean, in this listing and the later on, Venerable Fedor goes into the list of the different, the six main delusions and the 20 secondary delusions, a whole bunch of things in there. He goes into this, as well as we did in the mind module. But, you know, pride, for example, is, is a conceptual state of mind that over-exaggerates your importance. You could argue that low self-esteem is a conceptual state of mind that exaggerates your lack of importance. Jealousy is a conceptual state of mind that resents the happiness of someone else. I mean, you can get it down to bare bones. This is just the fundamental definition of these states of mind. And they're all conceptual stories. They're conceptual, they're, they're, con they're concepts, they're thoughts. But because we're so familiar with them, because we've been practicing them for eons, they're totally spontaneous. They're totally spontaneous. Right? We've perfected them virtually. So they're not experienced at a, as a thought. They're experienced as an intense compulsive emotion. And that means we 
And then that's why we don't notice them until our body's shaking, you know? So it's a very gross, gross level of them. So when you see a person shouting and yelling, you can see the evidence pretty quickly that there's anger there. But the shouting and the yelling is just physical. That's not the anger. The anger is the thoughts in their mind that are so intense, they explode into physical action, you know, because we practice them to perfection. They're deeply ingrained habits. So to unpack these habits mentally is a really intensely difficult job. In the first scope, we're unpacking the, the, the physical and verbal habits, which is hard enough. Here is much more subtle. And until we really understand this, you have to say we're not really being Buddhist, you know. And most of us just, it's hard to get this. It's hard to see the way these conceptual stories work, you know, and how they drive our lives and how they, so, so it's fairly evident that anger can be causing you suffering. That's fairly clear. But what we're getting at here in understanding the suffering of change is understanding attachment because it doesn't seem like suffering. And this is where it's really complicated, you know, it gets complicated. Because the essence of renunciation, I mean, Venerable Feder goes into so many more details in his outline from Lama Tsongkhapa. I just, I can't do it like that. And let you read his course notes, it's fantastic. I just want to talk about the essence of it, you know, the essence of it. So the simplest level of attachment that we're dealing with at this second scope of practice, you know, in the teachings, they don't go into great depth about what it is. They just, you know, it's trying to learn to see the suffering, how, how following attachment causes us suffering. So the obvious level of giving up attachment, if we look at the body and speech, it's obvious, you know, if you're trying to give up attachment, the first level is like, the first level is you stop, you stop having the object. It's pretty clear. You keep your hand in your lap if the cake is on the plate and you're craving and grasping at the cake. The pretty evident practice is at least control your hand and don't put more than one piece in the mouth. It's pretty obvious. And we get that when it comes to giving up things like alcohol, which is an extreme example of attachment. It's simply attachment. Don't give it another special name. It's just called attachment, but it happens to be the object is a pretty destructive object, isn't it, you know? So we all know the very first stage of renouncing, listen to my words, please, the very first stage of renouncing alcohol, alcoholism, the suffering of alcoholism, the very first level of practice of renouncing the suffering of alcoholism is to separate yourself from the object. It's really obvious. And that's the first scope. You give up the object. You stop drinking alcohol. So now, if you like using that as the analogy, in the second scope, we now want to look into also giving up the craving for alcohol, the attachment to alcohol. This is the way you can look at the two scopes of practice. The first level is, you know, you want to, you, you want to, you, you control the body first. And everybody knows it will be laughable to expect an alcoholic, listen to my words, to give up attachment to alcohol while continuing to drink alcohol. That would be a joke, wouldn't it? So the first level is at least separate yourself from the alcohol. This is first scope. Stop drinking alcohol. Now we all know the hard work starts. Giving up the delusion. And this is across the board because Buddha says every single thing we do, eating, sleeping, going to the toilet, getting up, scratching ourselves, walking here, going there, talking, going to a movie, having sex, having this, looking at a rainbow, everything we think and do and say, a normal person is utterly unconsciously, totally a junkie. Every millisecond following attachment driven by attachment, compelled by attachment, everything a normal person does morning, noon, and night. Now, this doesn't mean we don't have virtue as well. And this is why it's crucial 
as we've talked in the mind module, to make this absolute distinction between so-called negative and non-virtuous states of mind and positive virtuous states of mind. We don't talk like that in modern psychology. It sounds like judgment and we don't like that. In the modern psychological models of a human being, we give equal status to anger, attachment, love and kindness. We think they're all normal parts of a normal person, such that you'd be abnormal if you gave up some of them. But that's the Buddha's radical difference. He has found that all the delusions, the disturbing emotions, the afflictions, whatever terms you want, are not at the core of our being. In fact, they drag us down and they are the cause of all suffering of all sentient beings since beginningless time. That's his analysis. So therefore that's the practice. So therefore we need to understand what he means by that. Which means we have to dig down deep, delve into our minds and attempt to identify attachment, anger, jealousy, resentment, low self-esteem, arrogance, whatever word you like. We have to understand them intimately, precisely, with the microscope of our own mind. Then we can begin to give them up. This is where you really become a Buddhist. Being your own therapist, as Lama Yeshi puts it, is actually when you begin to be uniquely a Buddhist. Abiding by the laws of karma, which is the Buddhist view of just being an ethical person, that's common to any good religion. That's common to a good communist, a good feminist, a good anybody. Everybody has that as ethics. This is where you, into the second scope, this is where you uniquely take the Buddhist approach. Understanding his view of the mind understanding specifically the delusions and discriminating them, distinguishing them from the virtues and learning to drill down deep into these delusions and learn to unpack and unravel them so we know how they cause our suffering, so we know it's happened, so we know how to slowly, slowly give them up. Are we communicating? Okay. So let's look at why, what we mean by just a happy experience of say, getting a nice chocolate cake. Why for us, that's a happy experience. It's what we call happiness and what we aim for. We want life to be made up of as many happy experiences as we can. And it's very simple. It's very easy to say that that's how we all are. We, in our daily lives, think about it. We have unhappy experiences, like the, the crummy cake that's three days old, and we have the happy experiences, which is a nice, fresh, delicious cake. Think simply, please, ordinary experiences. The moment we get the unhappy experience, we don't want it. We push it away, we want the nice one. So we, our aim in ordinary daily life, every being in the universe, including the monkeys and the ants, are striving second by second to accumulate happy experiences. Think about it. That's what we mean by wanting happiness. And we are trying to avoid unhappiness. This is what drives every living being in the universe. So Buddha's not, Buddha's saying, great, go for it, honey. I've found methods to get happy feelings, which is what we're going to be going to. So before we even go there, in order to understand attachment, an anger, let's say, as being in the category called negative states of mind, and then to, have, and to understand how, say, love is a positive state of mind, we have to also understand where the state of mind called happiness, pleasant feelings, where that fits in this model of the mind. I don't think Federal goes into much detail about all this, but this is what I want to talk about. This is the real nitty gritty of understanding the Buddhist model of the mind. So there are thousands of states of mind and they all fit into three categories. There's no fourth. There are the neurotic, 
deluded, I-based, fear-based, non-virtuous, disturbing, distressing, misconceptions, many synonyms, which Buddha has found are not at the core of our being, are the source of suffering, and which we can get rid of. Second, you've got your virtues, your goodness, your kindness, your love, your compassion, your generosity, your self-confidence, your forgiveness. We know these. And we can grow these limitlessly. That's the Bodhisattva path. These are at the core of our being. And these are the source of our happiness, even relatively. Then you've got this third category, and I like to call them the mechanics of the mind. They're actually known as the neutral states of mind. This is very confusing to us because we, if we hear neutral, we hear not important. This is not the meaning. The meaning here of neutral is neither deluded nor virtuous. So that can, then gets abstract for us because we don't use these labels for states of mind. What do you mean not virtuous and not non-virtuous? What do you mean by that? We get confused. That's why we have to understand the way the Buddhist psychological model describes a negative or non-virtuous and a positive or virtuous state of mind. So this third lot, that's why I like to call them the mechanics of the mind. They're absolutely vital for your existence. If you're missing any of these, you'd be a mentally ill person. You couldn't function. So examples of these are intention, bare bones, I will, volition. That's the real meaning of karma, mental action. Everything exists on the tip of the wish, as Lama Zopa says. That's bare, every millisecond we have intention. We don't notice it because we're totally programmed. But every millisecond there's intention. I will. And if we didn't have that, we wouldn't do or think or say anything. So intention is one of these. That means it's not virtuous, but it's not non-virtuous. But it's a really seriously important state of mind. And it's called, and that's why I think mechanics is a good word. Then you've got concentration. This is absolutely fundamental. And Buddha's an expert at getting concentration. You know yourself, even you've got even just some, you've got no even ordinary concentration. You, you can't do anything. You'd be mad. You couldn't do anything. You've got a state of mind called, and we really misunderstand this, called mindfulness. It's a very specific thought in the mind. It, it is simply, it's a it's job. Each state of mind has a job. So it's job is to, when the mind gets distracted, like you're making a cake and you get distracted, then the mindfulness is the part of your mind that brings you back to, back to the job you were doing. So of course we need that in meditation. We've got so many weird words for mindfulness though. We've got so many weird misinterpretations of what it is. So as Lama Zobaruse says, thieves need mindfulness. It's not a virtue, it's not a non-virtue, meaning, you know, so it's, but it's a necessary part of your mind. And we have to train all these parts of our mind to use them to practice virtue. That's the point of them. So there's many of these. Now, the one I'm getting to, this is the point. There is another one in that third category called simply feeling. Now, this is huge in Buddhist psychology. You know, Venerable Fedor, when he goes into the 12 links of dependent arising, he mentions this. This is a massively important state of mind to understand. Absolutely vital. And there's only, and this is not used as an equivalent of like the word emotion, as we would say it. It's very bare bones. And every millisecond of any being existing is always having either a pleasant feeling an unpleasant feeling or a neutral feeling, which in this case means neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Feeling. And there's always going to be one of those. And this is in the neutral category, the mechanics category. So now let's look at a typical example of a scenario 
of what we think is trying to get happiness. Okay, before I go further, the word pleasant feeling is another word for that is happy feeling. We'll shorten it and it's called happiness. Now, this is the interesting point because we so confuse attachment with happiness as if they were the same state of mind. They are completely separate states of mind. So when we, and again, second, because we're so addicted to believing that the cake is the cause of my happy feelings. And when you remember your happiness, oh, tell me about your happiness, Rabina. You know, oh, you're really happy, Rabina. What happened? And I will not, I will describe the cake. But happy feeling is in the mind. But we're so convinced it came from the cake that we even think it's like as if it's the cake. When we have memories, we remember the events, the people, the cake. If it's suffering, we remember the brutal boyfriend. If it's happiness, remember the kind boyfriend because we are addicted to pointing to the outside. But we are here describing internal experiences. So let's look at the simple example of a scenario that we would think would be a method to get happy feelings, which is how to get happiness, getting the cake. And I will, we will go into the different states of mind that all play their role there and why for the Buddha, this is actually a scenario that is only causing suffering, not happiness. Now let's use, no, don't, don't use cake. Let's use Fred, a person, your boyfriend, okay? So, okay. Now, this is why, because in this, in this case, there are going to be three states of mind involved. One is attachment, which is in the first category called negative state of mind, non-virtuous state of mind. One is called love, which is in the positive category. It's a virtue. And the third state of mind is called happy feeling. So there's, you've, got a, you've got a positive one, a negative one, and a, and a, and a mechanic, mechanical part of your mind, the, 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 the neutral. But they, how they all play together as if they're all the one thing. This is why these experiences are so, we're so instinctively programmed in all of this. We, to unpack it is not what we do, but this is what we must do if we want to get renunciation, if we want to, you know, really apply Buddhism in our lives. So there we go. In the mind, there is attachment. That means it's an emotional hunger that assumes I'm somehow not enough on my own. So this is why we all crave for another half, isn't it? We assume you get a partner, you fall in love, you live together and you find happiness. I mean, being cliched about it. So attachment is there. It's an emotional hunger. It's a feeling of not being enough, not being satisfied on my own. What I've got, who I am is not enough. So we crave a person, let's say, not to mention everything else, all the objects of the senses, you know. So you meet Fred. And let's say he appears divine to you. This is even something extra. This is also adding karma into the mix. So that you suddenly bump to this bloke, you know, it seems like random. But you've got strong history with this fellow, strong history from past lives. And the moment you lay your eyes on Fred, he looks utterly divine to you. Even that is fascinating. That is the result of the extent of Fred's kindness to you in past lives. The equal to the extent to which he appears divine to you is the extent of his past kindness to you that you see him as divine. But from your point of view, also because of the karmic connection with each other, because this is like a, you're in this little kind of inter interdependent scenario together. Suddenly what happens is this, the, because of the past karma and then the extent of your past connection with each other, instantly in your mind, instantly he appears divine. And then with even before, even quicker than Google, in the next millionth of a second, very, very, very pleasant feelings are triggered. Hear my point, please. That's called happy feelings. Happy feelings. 
upon contact with that object labeled Fred, due to your past karma, you, you bump into him, and due to your virtuous past karma, he looks to his and yours, he looks divine. And then that next millionth of a second, you have very, very pleasant feelings are triggered, okay? Now, the next billionth of a second, attachment is triggered. So the pleasant feelings are what we want. All we want is pleasant feelings. Everything we do is to get pleasant feelings. All we want is a, is a, is a pleasant feeling. Think about it. It's, it's the reason we do anything is to get pleasant feelings. Think about this. So naturally, because the pleasant feelings are very delicious, they're really pleasant. Next millisecond, attachment kicks in, this vampire, this junkie in us, that then totally exaggerates his divineness. Within three seconds, you are believing that, of course, he is the cause of these happy feelings. Then attachment absolutely grasps at it, makes him appear totally divine, even more divine, and then totally believes that you've got to keep hold of him because you believe he is the cause of happy feelings. And, of course, you want more happy feelings. So, of course, you will cling to him. That's attachment. That's its job. Because you believe totally that he is the main cause of those delicious happy feelings. So attachment becomes, this little vampire kicks in and then wants to possess him, hold him, look at him, touch him, feel him, have him, eat him, do whatever. Look at how intense attachment is, you know. This is how we stay paralyzed in sense of and then you have to do all the business of keeping him. You've got to seduce him now and do all the things and, you know, what we do. But totally attachment here. Now, now this is the point. Pleasant feelings, you've got to hear this. Pleasant feelings, that joy you experience, is not a non-virtue. It is not attachment. Attachment comes in a millisecond later, but they're so utterly integrated, so utterly as if they're the same. We don't even do an analysis, you know. And then the belief, utter belief, that he, that body, Fred, is the main cause of those happy feelings. So, of course, you're going to cling to him, grasp at him, exaggerate his divineness, want to be with him for eternity. Of course you will. It's natural. Because it's, but all of these, are mis they're mistaken. Now, there's nothing wrong with happy feelings. That's not mistaken. But the belief of attachment that he is the cause of it and no remembrance of karma, that's the mistake. That's the mistake. So we're not just trying to give up happy feelings. We're trying to give up the lie of attachment, you know. As Lama Zopa says, because we believe this is all the same thing, when we hear that we have to give up attachment, we just conflate that with giving up, giving up happy feelings as well. Oh, you mean I've got to give up my happiness? I've got to give up my heart? Because these are so total, this is so subtle, you know, it's so instantaneous. It's so programmed within us. And this is why the tragedy of, let's say, I will use the example of this, you know, of a person who's, let's say, is addicted to fishing. You, for the first time you meet fishing, you're a little boy, you don't know you've got past lives, you don't know you've done killing in the past, you don't know there's a karmic tendency in your mind with fishing, and exactly the same way when you meet Fred, as soon as you meet fishing, the same thing happens. The extent of your habit of past killing equals the extent of the joy that arises in your mind. And then that equals the extent of the grasping and the attachment that believes fishing is the cause of the happy feelings and make an attachment makes the fishing look divine. And that's why you continue to kill fish. And then, of course, what else to do? You go straight to the lower realms because, you know, you just spent your life killing, never realizing it's negative because it looks divine. Attachment is the worst liar. Attachment is an absolute liar, you know, and we totally believe it. 
So along with this one with Fred, there's also a virtue called love. You do want Fred to be happy. The definition of love is a thought, may you be happy. So of course, it's easy to have those thoughts because you're so deliciously happy with divine Fred because he looks so divine to you. So it's easy to want a person you're attached to to be happy. But love is still a virtue. That's a virtue. Attachment is a non-virtue and happiness is neutral. So it's an example of a neutral state of mind, a happy state of a virtuous state of mind and a non-virtuous state of mind all coming together upon one object. And they're all mixed together like a big soup and we do not tell one bit from another because we don't understand the, the Buddhist model of the mind, which is what we have to do. If you don't understand this analysis, how do you know what to change? That's why everybody thinks renunciation is giving up happiness. You get some people, oh, I'm very renounced. Would you like some tea, Rabin? Oh, no, I don't want tea. Would you like coffee? No, I don't want coffee. You, you become nihilistic because you don't understand what a renunciation is because you can't distinguish attachment from, from happy feelings. This is that problem, you know. This is really quite subtle, I tell you. So you can't expect to see the difference because they're so spontaneous. That's why you've got to control your body and your speech first. There's some discipline, you know. Are we communicating? Ask me some questions now. Yes, Venerable. Thank you very much for this great okay. teaching. Good. Who's talking to me? It's Cyril. Okay, good, Cyril. Talk to me. Then Lorraine next. Good. Cyril. So I have me. a question. I'm I'm really um I have a hard time understanding how after having realized emptiness or in emptiness how can the virtuous state of mind of compassion arise if compassion is a state of mind or a dependent horizon cyril it's not the topic here but i will happily answer you okay it's been bothering me for a long time that's why I'm i know but i don't your question is riddled with misconceptions your assumption is once you realize emptiness, somehow everything's chucked out. The baby's chucked out with the bathwater. It's a total misconception about emptiness, Cyril, that you're implying. Because the point is, honey, when you've cut the delusions, think simply, please. When you've cut the delusions, what do you think is left in your mind? What would be left if you don't have anger, don't have attachment, don't have ego grasping, don't see Buddha yourself nature. in No, no, Cyril. Keep it on the earth, please, sweetheart. I've just mentioned before, there are three categories of states of mind. Can you please repeat them back to me? Pleasant, uh, virtuous, no, virtuous, no. virtuous and happy and happiness. No, non-virtuous is first, anger, jealousy, depression. Then virtuous, love, compassion, and kindness. Then the third lot are called neutral or mechanics. And you've got intention, concentration, mindfulness, me discrimination, many of these, and another one called feeling. And these have a neutral character. So forget the neutral ones and go back to the other two. So now when you have, as you say it, realized emptiness, what you've done is cut the root of the delusions, the neuroses. So if you don't have attachment and don't have ego grasping and don't have anger and don't have jealousy, what is left? Virtuous state of mind. There you just answered your own question. So you've got a wrong view of emptiness, Cyril, is your I problem. So look at it from another point of view. Keep it simple. When you realize emptiness, you've cut the root delusion that grasps at a separate me. Think mm -hmm. that way. When that sense of a separate me has gone, attachment has gone, mm -hmm. anger has gone, jealousy has gone. You are radiant. You are blissful. And now only your virtues are left a billion times more enhanced. So when you realize emptiness is when you will have a million times more compassion, not less. So you've got to fix your realize understanding emptiness. It's wrong, Cyril. I understand. Seeing it as nihilism. Okay. Are we communicating? Yes, I understand. Good, Cyril, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Lorraine. Un unmute, sweetheart. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, 
about the whole separate me thing. I had an experience a few years ago, four years ago, I had a severe um, nervous breakdown where I literally felt a part of my brain just snap. And at that moment, something happened where there's a part of me that's separate from me. And I've seen it in the mirror and I've seen it doing Qigong where it's this fiery, angry person that is also me, but is somehow separate from me. And this happened when I was thrown into a state where I had a delusion that was thrown in my face that totally, it was totally separate from. So what's the question? What's the question, sweetheart? I'm trying to figure out how to reconcile. I'm not sure. It sounds like from what you're saying, it sounds like this part of me is in a hell realm, the, the fiery anger. This well, I, 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 see, I'll just say, all I can do is use Buddhist terms a little bit to explain. If you've got countless lives, Lorraine, which means we've got countless actions we've done, they've left karmic imprints in your mind. There are countless memories in our mind. And sometimes in this life, weird ones come up. So for me, it's just some kind of weird experience that came up from past things, but you're mainly just doing, and then we interpret it in all sorts of ways. So you're interpreting it as a separate me, you're interpreting all these words, but your delusions just ma became manifest for a while and you kind of felt craziness and then you've calmed down again. It's just delusions came a bit kind of stronger is the simplest way to put it, Lorraine. That makes sense. I'm just trying to figure out how to reconcile because it feels like such reconcile anger. What, darling? Reconcile what, sweetheart? Well, that, that, try, I think I, what I want to do is diffuse the anger that this person- no, but you have to ask me what you mean by reconcile. Reconcile what? Because they feel separate. I feel like I'm separate in my mind. And I'm trying to... Please, I beg you, wait a minute. Are you saying this moment or when you're feeling crazy? constantly it's been everybody no, Lorraine that's that's exactly the mistake everybody feels separate and in fact that's because we've got delusions when you realize emptiness when you've cut the delusions there'll be an incredible sense of empathy and connectedness with other beings that's our true nature so everybody's separate some of us more experienced more we feel it more extreme than others this is because we have these neurotic states of mind that's the Buddhist yes. analysis. So the practice of lessening anger, lessening attachment, lessening ego grasping is the process of literally getting closer to other sentient beings, loosening, lessening that separateness. Quite, it's a good way to put it. So, so how do I lessen the anger? Sweetheart, that's what Buddhist practice is. I'm trying to, so I'm describing the problems here so we can understand them, so we can learn to get rid of them. That's what Buddhist practice is. Okay. But Thank just you. Keep, listening, keep trying to hear it. Keep trying to listen. I'm going to get into anger in detail. I'm trying to talk attachment first, which is the main one. Okay, so thank it's you. It's a whole new way of looking. So just kind of, as you as you are, have been doing, I know that, just listening, thinking about it, doing a bit of practice every day, and slowly, mm -hmm. slowly the pennies drop, you know? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Yes, Ariella, talk to me. Thank you, Veronica, Robina. I have a question about Fred. So after a month with this wonderful Fred, and when you understand that this is no good for you, why do we stay there? I understand that. So let's, we'll go there slowly, but we'll, let's look at the analysis. But one of the questions, I mean, that's one of the answers. I mean, one of the answers is because again of attachment, um, but no, maybe more than anything, one of the answers is because of strong karmic connection strong history from the past you're kind of like bound together and we don't have much we don't have much intelligence we don't have much common sense and also a multitude of other answers too when we have attachment Ariella it's not just seeing Fred as divine attachment is a sense of a low sense a low self-esteem I am nothing I'm nobody attachment is fear of upsetting somebody attachment is fear of not being liked attachment is fear of not having somebody there's a multitude of other things all rooted in the delusions darling we and virtually we have no common sense when we've got attachment and we make dumb decisions is a simple way to put it so i mean there's more to it than that but this is comp quite the delusions are so multifaceted you know so we've got to unpack and unravel the delusions in order to discover why we suffer so we can then make <laughs> wise decisions so just keep moving and keep listening ariella okay okay darling ariella <coughs> yes thank you Darling, thank you. Thank so you. Who else was there? Anybody else there, Tara? Tara, nobody else? Uh, no, I don't see. No, uh, in the chat okay. box, no. Okay, okay fine. Yeah. Wait. Huh? What happened? Somebody there? Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, what? I have to go closer. Oh, where's the camera here? Yes. Yeah. Oh, here, let me. Oh. 
Hi, Rabina. Who's that? It's the center. Oh, okay. Who's talking to me? Marlene. Hello, sweetheart. Talk to me. Yeah, so I've just been going around in my head the, uh, the most subtle level of suffering you were talking about. Do we need to recognise it is important at the sort of just the everyday level if I'm just doing like a bit of meditation? I mean, how... I, Are you I, referring to what I said was called um, all-pervasive uh, all suffering? Are you referring to that one? Well, well you know, there were three, weren't they? Like, yeah, that's the, right. There's the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and the all-pervasive suffering. That's to do with realising emptiness, darling, and then we're not discussing that here yet. Okay, thank you. All right, I will not think about that then. No, not at the moment. We're okay. discussing the suffering of change, which is a pretty intense one to realise anyway. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you, Nina. And let's look at the specific. Now, in terms of Fred, and Ariella's question is good, because as she said, after one month, you see, after one month, the attachment's gone, and now you see this ugly bloke. This is exactly the experience of this. That's why it's called the suffering of change. So listen, this is the technical reason why following attachment not only doesn't bring stable happiness, but it actually brings the, even the grosser level of suffering. It's called the suffering of change. So we know this experience intimately and Ariella's example was perfect. So there I am, past karma, past virtue with me and Fred, he appears divine. And then very pleasant feelings are, 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 arise in me. And then attachment kicks in and makes him appear totally divine, the cause of all my happiness. I cling to him, want him every day. And then, you know, all the rest as we know. Do you understand? So this is the cake, Fred, no matter what it is, you know. So the thing is this. We know perfectly well, and the cake is a simpler example, but Fred is exactly the same. The chocolate cake is on the plate. In the mind first, there's a feeling of dissatisfaction, which is the energy of attachment. You, something's missing, you know, it's painful, something's missing. Then you're thinking, what's going to, what am I going to have? What am I going to do? Because it, it becomes hankering after something. Then the cake appears in your mind. You get really excited. And now the anticipation starts, the expectation, then the manipulating and the controlling to get the cake, all of it driven by this intense emotional hunger and the belief that when I get the cake, I will get happy, happy feelings. So we know all that. So you get the cake. Now, this is the interesting point. First of all, we know it appears divine. We know it appears definitely attachment is so clear here. Attachment is a thought that exaggerates the deliciousness of the object. That cake definitely appears utterly divine. And the more emotional hunger you have, which is attachment inside you, the more that thought takes over and makes the cake look unbelievably divine. Our mind causes the cake or Fred to appear divine. And this is the tragedy of samsara. We believe it is divine. We never question for one second. So meanwhile, nevertheless, attachment makes it look divine. So all this excitement, all this anticipation, all this buildup, you've got to have the cake. So you know perfectly well, you put the cake in the mouth. And then, then, then what will happen instantaneously, it will definitely, and this is the point, trigger happy feelings. It will bring happiness. Happiness is a word for happy feelings. That's all. It will definitely trigger happiness. It will, guaranteed. We know it. Buddha's not arguing there. But this is the problem. This is the problem. Attachment has been craving, manipulating, building up, controlling, getting, finally drives the hand to put it in the mouth, anticipating this happy feeling. Happy feeling comes, but look what happens. Attachment, that second is not satisfied with that moment of happy feeling. It's attachment's nature by definition 
default is never satisfied. It's so evil, it's so tricky, it's so depressing to hear this. Attachment has been building up, building up, building up, so divine. The anticipation is almost, it seems to me, the anticipation of Fred and the anticipation of cake are the most delicious. The buildup and the expectation of that happy feeling, which does come. But look, that millisecond attachment at that second is not satisfied. That second attachment got what it wanted, but it's not satisfied. It's not enough. So you want another mouthful. And the anticipation is more desperate now. Well, maybe the second mouthful will do it. Maybe the second mouthful will literally make me satisfied. Because if you were satisfied, which means joyful, you'd put the cake, you'd leave the cake there. But no, so you have the second mouthful. And again, the, the, the attachment's wish is to get even more bliss, because that wasn't enough bliss, you see. But we know from analysis, the next mouthful triggers pleasant feeling again, but it's slightly less. It's a tiny bit less. The first one was always the best. But still attachment is not satisfied and now it's getting a bit desperate. So now you take a second piece of chocolate cake, still desperately waiting for happiness to come that is enough happiness, but it's not enough. So we have a third piece of cake. And by now it's going downhill fast and we're kind of getting desperate. We know this. And now what's happening if you use your intelligence and observe that that cake on the plate, now it's got a couple of pieces missing, that looked so divine before, you can almost faint. Now, how does the cake look? This is scientific experience. This is not religion. So now the cake looks revolting. You're now stuffed. The happy feelings have now changed into unhappy feelings you feel revolted you're stuffed and now you've it's changed from happy feeling to unhappy feeling which is the suffering of suffering this is what happens and have we been practicing this since beginning this time but what happens tomorrow you forget about the stuffed you forget about the cake looking ugly you forget about the unhappy feelings you forget all about that and you think the cake might do it this time and you bash your head against the brick wall again and the buddha says we've been doing this for eons i think we recognize this but it's depressing isn't it why because we think excuse me buddha what am i supposed to do how else can i get happiness what's your method mate because we don't have another method, do we? In other words, the only way in general, in life, being an ordinary samsaric person, the only way in life that we know in general how to get happy feelings is to get an object of the senses. Now, if we have lots of virtue, if we're really kind, really loving, really patient, really compassionate, really generous, we would, we would be, they are the main cause of happy feelings. But because we have so much attachment and therefore so much aversion, because that, experience, that feeling of happy feeling, which came from attachment, as the cake looked delicious, it triggered happy feelings. But then the second piece, the third piece, the cake begins to fade in front of you and it gradually now looks disgusting because aversion has replaced attachment and unhappy feelings have replaced happy feelings. So now you have aversion and the feeling is disgust because they so predominate and then the jealousy and then the resentment and the depression and the anxiety and the boyfriend giving you up and not getting the job and getting too fat because we're predominantly overwhelmed by our delusions. And I'm not talking about being a terrorist or a rapist here. I'm talking about ordinary human beings. Then we know we've got virtues but we don't really know how to access them. And we don't, and sort of like, it's, the more we're caught up in our own misery, it's exhausting to think that I've got to get happy by loving other people. Hey, what about me, mate? But it's true, in fact. 
We know people who are just naturally kind and loving and are quite happy people because they practice virtue and they don't have much attachment. They don't have much anger. They don't have much dissatisfaction. That's what we're aiming for. We've all got the potential. So in general, basically, what Buddha is saying is this. Listen, mates, you think that happy feelings are what you get when you get an object of attachment. And he's not arguing. It does trigger happy feelings. But the way they say it in the teachings, that happy feeling is contaminated. It's limited. It's polluted. Please check the alcoholic. Please check the person who eats 10 pieces of cake a day. Please check the junkie. When you see that junkie who's distressed beyond words with the craving, the nightmare of the craving, get their fix, that is a relief from the intensity, but you can't pretend that that's happiness. It's like grotesque. The person who once has to jump on 20 girls a day, it's like a nightmare. So, but it's just, it's this addiction. We're all addicted. So it's all a question of degree. So Buddha's not saying we don't get happy feelings, but he says the happy feelings you get are so limited and so polluted and they do not last. Now, we don't have any experience ever of having happy feelings that last. So it seems confusing to think that that's possible. We only know happy feelings from getting an object of the senses, which turns into unhappy feelings the more you have the object. So Buddha's saying, okay, what he's found is you think happy feelings or happiness, joy, you name it, or they're all synonyms, joy, contentment, fulfillment, bliss, happy feelings, happiness, they're all synonymous. We believe totally that happy feelings are what we get when we get the object of attachment. But Buddha, but Buddha says, no. Happy feelings that won't change into unhappy feelings. Happy feelings that will last as happy feelings. You get those when you've given up attachment. That's his method. Renunciation of suffering and its causes brings happy feelings that are a billion times more powerful than any happy feelings we've had through our senses, and they will not change into unhappy feelings. That's Buddhism. That's Buddhist practice. That's Buddhist psychology. Okay? So way to go. Don't hold your breath, babies. But that's the method. So that's enough for today. So think about that, please. All right. Thank you, darlings. That's the entire module, I'm afraid. I've given you the whole module. I've got five, 12, 19, three more classes to go. I'm sure I'll talk. I'm sure I'll think of something to talk about. So think about this, please, people. And next time you have the cake, try and identify attachment and uh, the pleasant feeling and see if you can try and imagine them separate. And then see how the pleasant feelings gradually, inexorably become our happy feelings the more cake you get. Because Buddha's logic is this. If cake, or Fred for that matter, is actually the main cause of happy feelings, then clearly the more cake, the happier you'll get. We know that's not true. <laughs> Very simple. Even with Fred. As Ariella said, after one month, he's a creep, you know. Okay, some people take longer to get bored by Fred, and you can have some, and that's only because you've got love in the, in the mix. If you've got love and compassion in that relationship, that's why it will last. If there's only attachment, honey, it won't last long, I promise. Okay. Jung Chub, Semcho, Grimboche, Makie Panam, Kie Gu Chig, Kie Pan Yam Pa Me Pa Yang, Gong Ne Gondu, Pawa Shog. That's it, darlings. Much love. Thank you so much. Happy to see you all. And, Thank, uh, you, Venerable, okay. Thank you, Venerable Rubina. Thank you. Thank you.